Hello everyone. Hi. Welcome again to our small church services online. Hope everyone is doing well. Yeah, they had one hour extra sleep, right? Yes. So <laughs> that must uh, feel good. <laughs> yeah. So today um, we will have Dr. Dan Rogers again for the sermon. And uh, I don't have uh, updates or details from our membership, but uh, we continue to pray for those who are sick and seniors among us. Um, there are a lot of uh, people who are still suffering from the pandemic, but uh, we know that there's a light at the end of the tunnel now with uh, more vaccinations available for small kids uh, ages 5 to 11. So that's good news. So we continue to pray for um, God's uh, intervention on behalf of all the people around the world. So <clears throat> uh, with that, uh, let us open in prayer. Okay. Dear God, our Father, we thank you so much once again for this uh, wonderful time that you've given us to be together in spirit and in truth worshiping you lord wherever we are and we thank you for uh, each other we thank you for denomination we thank you for uh, leadership and uh, ministers and pastors so we thank you once again for your love and for your mercy uh, on all of us for counting us worthy of your love and worthy of your um, grace and indeed uh, we are part of your family now and it's all because of your love so thank you lord once again for all our members and we pray for those who are sick and afflicted uh, like auntie beatrice and uh, dorothy even oma and uh, joyce and um, tommy and also we pray for jr as well and for all the others who we may be missing uh, at this point, we pray for your intervention on them also. I just remembered uh, Rick Guevara as he is recovering from the effects of virus. So we thank you, Lord, for your love again. And we just praise you and give you thanks for this service. And we pray all these things now in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. For our worship songs, our opening song will be Love the Lord and followed by At the Foot of the Cross. And for closing song, we will sing When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. For our scriptures for today, we have Mark 12 verses 29 through 31. The most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Amen. Amen. Let us worship.
My name is Celestine Olive, and uh, most of my friends call me Cella. I attend New Hope Christian Fellowship. It's a congregation of Grace Communion International. I've been married to the same wonderful man, Leonard Olive, for 42 years. We have two sons, three grandsons, and one daughter-in-law. Family is about as good as it gets, because they are my pride and joy. I serve as an elder assistant pastor, uh, director of our music ministry, and always a singer. I've always sung, my whole family is in music, and I have been a part of this congregation for about 43 years in all of its transitions and wonderful changes that God has brought into our lives. People tell me that I seem like a person who have a lot of peace and that I just walk in faith and I have to let them know, without God and without praying, without ceasing, that's not me walking like that. It's Jesus in me. Um, growing up in Houston, Texas had its challenges. Um, you can imagine having a household with 11 kids in it, but also my dad came, became an alcoholic pretty early on in my life. I found out really early that I could not fix or change my dad which was my original prayer to God, to just fix him or get him out of my life. That was my two options. And yet through that, God showed me that I can learn to relate to those who are having difficulties because my dad had a difficulty. And God has shown me, I was never not with you. I am with you daily, I'm with, I'm with your dad. And so just walking through that, it has so strengthened me to know that he's there. He did work out situations in my family, not the way that I had hoped, but he helped get us through it. God is not just out to just give us what we need or think we need instantly. He's a God who fixes from the background. He's a God who fixes attitudes and emotions and gives us a stability that we cannot get any other way than connecting with him. My family has had the incredible blessing of being gifted in music. And it's just been a huge amount of joy, even growing up in our home and the dysfunctions that we had. And I know that it's from the equipping of the Holy Spirit. It has led me and given me opportunity to do outreach in the community. I sing with a community concert choir. It gives me an opportunity to sing and to share and to serve outside of our congregation. And I just really enjoy being among people of different faiths, people of different ethnicities, and to 
exercise a passion that God has given me for music. Sharing in other people's lives really always gives us opportunity to pray because everyone has a need. And as I find myself singing with different ones, we hear of the difficulties they are having with family, with their children, with health um, challenges. And so prayer is just so important. Everywhere I go, I am, I'm on mission for Jesus Christ. I want to hear the needs of others. I want to step into that brokenness. I know it can be messy sometimes, but I want to step into it and I want to pray with them and I want to show them that there's light at the end of the tunnel. If we bake, if we sing, if we dance, if we, no matter what capacity we serve in, there's always a need out there that can be met just for us. All of us can do that and all of us should because, you know, God says, I'm sending my son, I'm sending you. When are we not, when are we not on mission for Jesus? I don't know. Have you ever been caught in a hurricane or a tornado? It can be a harrowing experience. If you're lucky, the only experience you've had with these monsters is footage from the news. But these images don't give you a good picture of the devastation occurring. That only becomes clear after the clouds depart and the sun returns. Only then can you see that everything was being mercilessly tossed about, scrambled and shredded. Yards have found new decorations, and some houses have found new yards. Cars have mysteriously traveled on their own and parked in the most unusual places. Neighbors who have never met are now intimately acquainted with each other's belongings. The familiar landmarks that were reminders of home have now been reduced to litter strewn across an unrecognizable landscape. Some things that once seemed secure and permanent have been exposed as weak and temporary. Any sound advice for those caught in the path of a destructive storm will include seeking shelter in a structure that is stable enough to withstand powerful winds. Some houses that are frequented by storms have built-in concrete safe rooms or underground storm shelters. If these are not available, people are encouraged to move to the most central room in their homes. If caught outdoors in a storm, it may seem instinctive to hide in a car or under a tree but these are the last places to be. Where do you run when the winds of devastation blow your way? And I don't mean just the literal storms, but I'm referring to the life-altering storms that we all face. Scripture has always pointed us to our one true place of safety, and that is in Jesus Christ. He is the one sure rock of refuge that no storm can move. Many who have taken shelter in him call out to others to do the same. Here's one such example recorded in Psalm 34. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord and he answered me and delivered me from all my fears. Look to him and be radiant so your faces shall never be ashamed. This poor soul cried and was heard by the Lord and was saved from every trouble. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who fear him and delivers them. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are those who take refuge in him. The psalmist knew where his safety was found. If at any time you find yourself being tossed about, scrambled and shredded in a raging storm, there's a place of safety that no storm can move. His name is Jesus. Others can attest to the fact that he is your reliable rock and solid refuge in the storm. 
I'm Kara Garrity, speaking of life. come to the place in Mark's gospel where Jesus and his disciples are now in Jerusalem for the final Passover of Jesus' ministry on this earth. And at this time, Jesus is accosted and questioned by the chief priests, the Sadducees, the elders, the Pharisees, the scribes, and the Herodians. All of these various groups among the religious leadership of the Jewish people at that time were trying to get Jesus to say something that would get him in trouble with the Roman government or with the Jewish people. But they failed as Jesus answered all their questions very wisely and amazed them with the wisdom of his answers. So this brings us up to Mark chapter 12, verse 28, where we encounter a person who is a scribe but seems to be sincere and have a sincere question to ask Jesus. So let's look at verse 28 of Mark chapter 12. Mark tells us, one of the teachers of the law came and had heard them debating, heard the Sadducees in context debating with Jesus. So one of the teachers of the law. Now, what is that? Well, the Greek word here is grammaton. And teachers of the law is really an interpretation by the translators. The word grammaton in Greek uh, literally means a writer. We may recognize the word. We have some similar words to it. Uh, gramma is the Greek word for letter. Graphene is the verb from Greek to write or to draw. And can you imagine some of the English words that we get from that Greek? Grammar. We get uh, such words as graph, graphics, photograph, diagram, and graphite. You know what graphite is? That's the stuff in the pencil that makes it right. So these are the grammaton, the writers, the secretaries are, as it's often translated, and then you'll see it in the King James, scribes, and the word scribe, of course, means to write. Now, in the Gospel of Mark, these, I'm gonna call them scribes, are the greatest opponents. 22 times they're mentioned in opposition to Jesus. So they're like the villains of the Gospel of Mark. The original term in Hebrew was sophair, from the verb safar, which meant to cipher. And that's another term we use for, for writing or figuring even numbers, to cipher. It was a noun that came to mean someone who writes, a scribe or a secretary. Now, they were officials who had the charge of writing and copying legal documents, including the preservation of what we call the Old Testament scriptures. In Jesus' day, the main business of the scribes was teaching the law with a focus on its legal application. And thus, since they wrote legal documents and they made legal pronouncements and they analyzed how the law of Moses affected people legally in Judea and throughout all the regions where the Jewish folks were in that day. They were what we might call lawyers, not lawyers who went to trial, but lawyers who dealt with the law and who dealt with legal documents. So some of the scribes, but not all, were members of the religious political party of the Pharisees. So, Scribes could be any party or no party at all. Some were Sadducees, some were other things. And probably in the days of Jesus, it's likely that most of the scribes belonged to the religious political party of the Pharisees. 
So here comes one of these opponents of Jesus, but this individual seems to have a little bit of a different attitude from most of the other scribes. Verse 28. So one of the scribes came and had heard them, the Sadducees and Jesus debating. Noticing or seeing that Jesus had given them a good answer, so he was impressed by the way that Jesus was able to answer these very tough questions the Sadducees had been asking him, trying to get him in trouble, trying to trip him up, trying to make him look foolish. But his wisdom had impressed this scribe, and he thought, wow, this, this is a great teacher. This, this man knows what he's talking about. I'm impressed. So noticing that Jesus had given them a good answer, he asked them, of all the commandments. Now, how many commandments were there? Well, we think, well, 10. No, not if you were a Pharisee. There were 613 commandments. So he wanted to know of all these 613 commandments, which is the most important? Which is the first of them all? Which is the foremost? And the Jews debated at that time about the law, and they realized that some laws were what they called light, and other laws were what they called heavy, in other words, more important. So they tried to decide among all the laws which were the more important laws and which were the less important laws. And now this man asked Jesus, what's the greatest of all the laws? Verse 29, the most important one, answered Jesus, is this. Hear, O Israel, hear. The Hebrew Aramaic term, the Shema. And this was something that was recited by pious Jewish folk in, Jew in Jesus' day. Uh, every morning when you awoke, the first thing, particularly if you were a male, you were supposed to do is recite the Shema, the Hear, O Israel. So he says, this is the most important of all the laws. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Or the Lord is one Lord. In other words, there are no other gods, goddesses. There are no pagan deities. And remember, Mark is writing for an audience in Rome. And of course, his audience is primarily Gentile, and they've come up through paganism. And so he has Jesus make this point very clear that the Lord our God is one. One. There are no other gods besides our God. So the Lord our God is one. And he's quoting now from Deuteronomy 6, verses 4 and 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. This is the greatest of the commandments, Jesus says. Love. And he uses the term agapeo, agape, the deep kind of what the New Testament uses as godly love. And that should give you a clue here as to what's going on. This is the kind of love you can only get where? From God. So how do you love God? <laughs> love him with the love he gives you with which to love him in return. So love the Lord your God with all your heart. All your heart. That's the emphasis there. All your heart, cardia in the Greek, you hear English words, cardiac, cardiac arrest, cardiologist, cardia. All your heart, your emotions, your feelings, with all your soul, your suke, your being, your total personality, all you are as a human, and with all your mind, and the word there, would better be understood as understanding, with all of your understanding and with all of your strength, all of the physical strength and ability that you have to muster, love God with it. Then he says the second, and this is, in other words, logically inferred from the first, the second is this, and now he's going to quote from Leviticus 19, verse 18. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, in Leviticus 19, 18, neighbor is understood as your fellow Israelite, someone from your community. 
But we remember that Jesus expanded the concept of neighbor. Remember the story of the Good Samaritan? Who is your neighbor? Everyone is your neighbor. Even your enemies are your neighbor. Love your neighbor as yourself. There is no commandment greater than these. Now, it was common for rabbis to interpret the law like this, weightier, lighter, sum it all up. In fact, Rabbi Hillel, who died about 10 AD, a couple of generations or decades before the time of Jesus, said this, what you hate for yourself, do not do to your neighbor. This is the whole law, the rest is commentary. So there was a Jewish concept of there were things in the law that were more important and more binding than others. But Jesus takes this concept of neighbor to a whole nother level to include really all people, all humans. Now, why did he do that? Well, Jesus represented humanity. He represented all humans. If you love your neighbor, you love Jesus. Is Jesus your neighbor? Yeah, you love him. Well, if you love Jesus, you've got to love everyone. Anyone who says, I love the Lord and hates his brother is a liar. So you love Jesus, and Jesus represents and includes all humanity. So as Jesus makes this pronouncement, he's going far beyond anything the Old Testament scriptures or the scribes or anyone thought about the law You've got to love humanity, love all people. Everyone is included. After all, are we not all made in God's image? Every single human being. Are we not all, in that sense, the children of God? Verse 32. Well said, teacher, <laughs> the man replied. Now, he was a scribe, but he doesn't seem to be an opponent, does he? He seems to admire Jesus. But how does he admire Jesus? How does he look at Jesus? He's a good teacher. You'll hear people say that today. Well, I think Jesus was a good teacher and gave a lot of good moral precepts that we probably ought to try to live by. And that's about as far as they go. Jesus was more, so much more than just a good teacher. Well said, teacher, the man replied. You were right. Oh, thanks very much. Like we need to describe telling Jesus he's right. You were right in saying that he, not God, uh, they didn't use the term God uh, because they felt that was taking his name in vain. So you check the Greek text and God is not in it. It says he, the pronoun he. You're right in saying that he is one and that there is no other gods, goddesses, whatever, but him. To love him with all your heart, with all your understanding, with all your strength, and to love your neighbor as yourself is more important than all, or actually the whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. This was something this man understood. Good for him. And when it says the whole burnt offering and sacrifices, it means the, very, the, the sacrifice and offering par excellence. The greatest sacrifice you could possibly offer to God, this was far greater, to love God and to love your neighbor. Of course, he doesn't really understand the concept of what Jesus means by love your neighbor. So verse 34. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, or, or I think better translated, sensibly, that was a sensible answer. When Jesus saw that he had answered sensibly, he said to him, you are not far off from the kingdom of God. And from then on, no one dared ask him any more questions. He shut them up. Because every time they asked Jesus a question, he turned the question back on them and made them look stupid and foolish and ignorant and embarrassed them in front of all the people. And so they decided, we can't win with this guy. We're just going to quit asking him questions because, man, he has an answer for everything and he makes us look stupid when he does. But there are several things to notice here. One is they should have asked Jesus more questions. 
They should have, but they should have asked him the right question. And this man, who seems sincere, who is not far from the kingdom of God, but you notice, not in the kingdom of God, close, but not in. What's he missing? Well, he should have asked the question, who is Jesus? That's the question he should have asked. Who are you, Jesus? Messiah, Lord, Savior, Son of God? That would have been good to know. So he came close, but he failed to ask the most important question of all. Who is Jesus? Teacher or Savior? Wise man or Son of God? Do I admire him or should I worship him? These are some questions the man should have asked but didn't. So, what are we to learn and conclude from this account? Well, obviously, we should learn that we should love God, right? We should love God. How? Well, it says, with all of our heart. Arcadia. How do you love God with all your heart? Well, what did Jesus say? Where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. So your treasure should be with God, to love God with all your heart. And what is your treasure? And what is it? Well, your treasure is your time. That's, we all have time. We all have the same amount of time in every day. We all have been given time. Your talent. God has given everyone talent. Sometimes we don't think he has, but he has. Some have more than others, but everyone has been given talent by God. And your resources. Financial resources and other resources you may have. That's your treasure. So what does it mean? Well, time is one of our treasures. Where we put our time is where our heart is. Do we put in our time with God? Time with God every day. Prayer. Meditation. Silence. And silence is an oft too little practice spiritual discipline. I remember in my doctoral program, I took a seminar on Quaker spirituality, and one of the elements of Quaker spirituality is to sit in silence. And so the professor asked the group, about 20 or so students, to sit in silence for 10 minutes. Most of them couldn't do it. Some of them got out their phones. <laughs> Others had to get up and leave the room. To sit 10 minutes in silence was, was too much for them. Well, at the end of the seminar, which was about a week or 10 days long, the final exam was this, to sit in the room silently for 45 minutes. If you sat silently in the room for 45 minutes, you passed the class. <laughs> Not everyone passed. <laughs> It's so hard for us in this world to be silent and listen to God and commune with God and to recognize that he's present with us always. Just shut up and listen. Think about it, meditate, pray, but sometimes just be silent and love God with all your heart. We should use our God-given talents and gifts, whatever God has given you, whatever your abilities may be, we should use them to serve God and to serve our fellow humans in whatever way, however. Some people say, well, if all you can do is pray, pray. But pray is not just all you can do, it is so much you can do to be a prayer warrior. And you may have other physical things you're able to do as well, but to serve God and to serve others. And we should all be good stewards financially. Sometimes we forget that that's a part of really the Christian walk is to take care of our finances 
and to be wise and not lust and covet more than we can afford, but to live within our means. Live within, not, I mean, most people live at their means, <laughs> like on the cliff. But live within your means and set aside money for the work of God, for the ministry of Jesus Christ. That's our job. That's a part of our worship and a part of our service and a part of our loving God with all our hearts. Also, he says, we should love God with all of our soul, our suke, our, our, our being, our, all that we are as a human entity, our personality, everything, our whole being. Now, how do you love God with your whole being? Well, one of the important things I think they're to realize is that our lives are not divided into the sacred and the secular. And here's what I mean by that. Say, well, I'm a Christian. I go to church on Sunday morning. And while I'm there, I praise and I worship. And once in a while during the week, I pray, and sometimes I do some Bible study, but then I got to get on with my work. I got my house to clean. I got my job to go to. I got my children to take care of. I've got this to do. I've got that to do. I've got all these things before me. And sometimes I just like to recreate. Sometimes I just like to watch TV. And then other times uh, I worship God. No, life is not divided into the sacred and the secular. Life is your whole suke. Everything we do every day is in participation with God. You don't ever get separate from God. And sometimes we don't see like even playing a sport is participating with God. Well, how do you play? How do you treat others? Do you follow the rules? Good sportsmanship. And you name it, whether it's your work or whether it's being a grandparent or, or watching, whatever you do, we need to understand that it's all with God and that we participate with God in the entirety of our lives. Every nanosecond we're alive. It's all holy time. Our whole being. So our entire personality, vocation, occupation, recreation, our total life is spiritual. And in participation with the triune God. Love God with all of our mind, with all of our understanding. Well, how do we get understanding? Well, that can come through personal Bible study. That's an important part of our spiritual lives to understand God is to study and seek to understand his word. And also listen to teaching. We come, we hear a sermon, but I hope we're doing even more than that. Find good teachers, good books to read, to understand more about God, that we can love him with all of our mind, with all of our understanding. We need to understand what the will of God is so that we might more effectively participate in his will. And love God with all of our strength. A wholehearted effort with all of our, our, our energy, our stamina, everything we have. And, you know, some of us say, well, I don't have very much. Fine. Use what you have. With all of whatever strength God has blessed you with, seek him, serve him, do his will. We do all that we can do and trust God to make up for what we lack. Still, we need to try to live a healthy and active life so that we can participate effectively with Jesus Christ in his ongoing ministry. We do whatever God has given us to do with, we do it. And know that the Lord will take care of the rest with all of our strength. Now, all of this is very important. And you probably... If you ever hear a lot of messages on this pericope, this section of scripture, you're probably going to hear these things talked about. But if that's all we talked about, if that's all we focused on here in this section of Mark, we've missed the main point. Did you hear me, church? We've missed the main point. What is the main point? The key understanding is found in verse 34. Where Jesus says, you are not far from the kingdom of God. 
Yeah, but you're not there. <laughs> you're not far. You're close, but you're not there. You got all these commandment things going on for you, but you're not there yet. You're close. But you're missing the most important thing of all. The scribe knew the law. I would dare say that scribe knew the law better than any single one of us in this room. He knew the law. He understood the weightier matters. He understood that loving God and loving your neighbor were the most important things and fulfilled the whole law. He understood that. He knew that. But he still had not entered into the reign and rule of God in his life. He had not entered into the kingdom of God yet. As far as his experiencing it and knowing it and realizing it and enjoying it. He was close, but not there. So as I said, he should have asked another question. He shouldn't have stopped there. He asked one question and was satisfied and went away. He should have said, Jesus, who are you? Who is Jesus? Why? Well, Jesus is the way into the rule and reign of God. He is the door. He is the way. There's no other way into the reign and rule of God than through Jesus. It's not through the law. It's not through actions or physical effort or anything you or I do. Should we do those things? Yes. But that's not what gets you into the kingdom of God. What gets you into the kingdom of God is accepting Jesus Christ as your Savior and worshiping him. It is by grace that you are saved and grace that you enter into the kingdom of God. So the man was close, but not there. Commandment keeping will not get you into the kingdom of God. Apart from Jesus and his spirit, we cannot truly spiritually love God and love our neighbor. Can you really truly love God and love your neighbor apart from God on your own effort, by your own will, by your own striving, by your own saying, I'm going to do it. I'm going to love God. Good luck with that. I'm going to love my neighbor even if they hate me and you despise me and are my enemies. I'm going to love them. Oh, good luck with that. You can't do that apart from God. For humans, it's impossible. But thankfully with God, it is indeed possible and it will happen. All human effort, no matter how sincere, will fall short apart from Jesus. And the man had Jesus right there. Right there. Jesus was right there in front of him. So close. So near. And yet so far away because he didn't ask the right question. If you want to truly love God with all your heart, all your mind, and all your spirit, and if you want to truly love your neighbor as yourself, accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. Repent. Be baptized. Again, I invite anyone who has not yet been baptized. Talk to me about it. Talk to someone about it. Accept Jesus Christ as your Savior. That's the only way you can enter into the kingdom, the reign, the rule of God. Repent and be baptized. Believe in Jesus. Trust in Him. Rely on Him. And when we do by God's grace and the power of the Holy Spirit, we enter into the experience of the rule and reign the kingdom of God by His grace and by His power. By God's grace and power of the Holy Spirit, you and I will not just be near the kingdom of God. By God's grace and by God's power through Jesus Christ, we will be in the kingdom of God. Now and forever. When I
For our benediction, the amazing grace of the Master Jesus Christ, the extravagant love of God, the intimate friendship of the Holy Spirit be with all of you. Amen. <music>